Hi everyone. Uh, so I have never done a YouTube live before, but I thought I would just jump on here, say hi, and uh, give you a bit of an update around what's going on with the gay Aristo, my PhD in country house studies, and also a couple of books that I've really been enjoying and I'd like to recommend for you. So firstly, if you haven't yet subscribed and you're interested in history and you're interested in hidden history and you're interested in LGBTQ plus history, well, you've found the right channel. So youtube.com forward slash gay Aristo is where I share hidden history, beautiful country houses and the history of LGBTQ plus people. Because so often in history, LGBTQ plus people lives have been edited out of existence. Uh, nobody, um, because of legal discrimination, because of punishment at the time, because their ancestors potentially were worried about the reputation uh, of their ancestor, their letters were destroyed, their writings are redacted, and we don't really have much history of LGBTQ plus people. So I want to bring that to life other than in the criminal reports that you see. So there's lots of case law throughout history, LGBTQ plus people are recorded as criminals, whether it's being put in the stocks or being put to death. Now, I think it's important that I look at those uh, primary texts, but also I want to bring the life of real people, humans, their relationships, their loves, their lives to light. So that's what I'm trying to do on the gay aristo so hopefully you're enjoying it so far if you haven't subscribed yet then do subscribe and hit the bell um, and make sure that you also check me out on my instagram at gay aristo so i do kind of regular shorts on here but then longer play episodes we've recently just uh, done a video in um conjunction with the strawberry hill house trust strawberry hill is the amazing gothic mansion which was created by 18th century society and literary figure horace warpole absolutely you think the houses of parliament or saint pancras station is beautiful wait till you get to the wonderful white gothic fantasy that is strawberry hill and there's an amazing video they gave us the house for the day it was closed and we got to wander around and do an incredible lgbtq plus tour so definitely worth checking that out recently i have just been uh, a guest on the History in 20 podcast. You can find it here on YouTube, History in 20, where I'm talking about five key figures in LGBTQ plus history. I love that podcast. You can obviously get it on Spotify, but you can watch it here. You get more of this fabulous wallpaper behind me there. And I'm gonna be talking, uh, it's launched now, it came out last week, and I'm talking about five key historical figures. Talking of history um, and historical figures, if you're looking for a couple of good book recommendations, I would recommend firstly, this book, Bosey by Douglas Murray. So Bosey is really castigated. People, people have got a view of Bosey, a very negative view of Bosey. You know, they blame him for the fact that Oscar Wilde went to trial, that he took Lord Queensbury, Bosey's father, to court for his reputation, for the slur that Lord Queensbury made to his reputation when he left a card at Oscar Wilde's club saying he was posing as a sodomite. Is that fair? Mm, not sure. I'm going to examine that. But also what happened to Bosey? We know that, you know, after two years hard labour in Reading Jail, that Oscar Wilde went to live in Europe. Uh, he had Bosey with him for some of that time, for most of that time, although very, very, I'd say toxic and difficult uh, and slightly coercive relationship. But they did spend a lot of uh, Oscar's last few years together. He wasn't there at Oscar's deathbed, unfortunately. Uh, he didn't quite make it. Robbie Robson, who's one of his friends, tried to get Bosey there in time, but he wasn't able to come. But what happened to Bosey afterwards? That's what no one really knows. Well, this fantastic book by Douglas Murray lifts the lid on what happened to Bosey. He sued Churchill at one point. Um, he ended up in a basement flat in Hove, just by Brighton, and he lived until the 1940s. So imagine you started with Queen Victoria, and you end with the Second World War. So I want to really dig a little bit more and do an episode on the definitive life 
of Lord Alfred Douglas Boise Boise or Boise as he was called by his mother as a child and that was kind of the the name they had for him in the house Boise Boise was a uh, kind of an, an amendment of Boise and it was a kind of a family pet name no one knew of it outside the family but when he was at Winchester at school his brother sent him a telegram uh, starting with darling Boise now, Boise wasn't in his house that day. He was out. And when he returned home in the evening, his telegram was sitting in the house hall. All the boys had read it and they all were shouting, my darling Boise!" And the name stuck, which I think is quite hilarious. Um, another book that I will recommend, and it is connected with my PhD, is The Long Weekend by Adrian Tinniswood. He's also written an amazing book, which is available also on um, Audible. If you uh, if you like listening to your books, like me, I have lots of uh, lots of downtime, or I travel to London from Wales about three hours uh, every week up and three hours down. So I love my Audible. Well, Noble Ambitions was Adrian's last book, which is about the rise, decline, and then rise again of the country house, which is fascinating available on Audible. Sadly, The Long Weekend is not available on Audible. The Long Weekend is life in the country house between the wars. And it really talks about um, weekend escapades, uh, some of the Downton Abbey type things that you will you know, imagine you've seen uh, on Downton Abbey. But there's a fascinating chapter if you're interested in LGBTQ plus history, A Queer Streak. Uh, and there he talks about Cecil Beaton. He talks about Lord Montague. Uh, he took the fascinating Lord Montague case, who was an English aristocrat who, with Peter Wildblood, was tried and sent to jail for um, supposedly um, some sexual shenanigans and uh, same sex sexual shenanigans. Um, and Peter Wildblood actually um, gave evidence to the government committee when they were reviewing uh, the legal status of homosexuals, the decriminalization of homosexuality, which eventually happened in the 1960s in the UK. Uh, and Peter Wildwood uh, has written um, a fantastic book, which um, I really recommend if you're if you're looking uh, for um, for something around kind of the history of LGBTQ plus people. Um, I would check out his book and I have just gone completely blank about what it is, but I will find it um, and tell you about it later on. But that brings me actually nicely on to my PhD. I'm clutching here um, my PhD plan. I started an MA um, two years ago in country house studies and I thought to myself, gosh, you know, I've loved country houses all my life. Um, my parents used to drag me around National Trust properties. Actually, they didn't need to drag me. I absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, go, I lived as a child very near Kenwood House in Hampstead. So we would spend um, our, our weekends um, up at Kenwood House, looking at the ceilings, looking at the art, rolling down the hill um, in the parkland. So I will, um, I, uh, I, I've loved country houses all my life. And last year, well, 2021, I saw this, course, 2022, I thought this course was advertised, from the University of Buckingham, the MA in Country House Studies. So literally, I saw it in the last week, the applications could be in. I wrote my application, not thinking, A, I've only got a GCSE in um, in history, thinking, I'll give it a shot, but I'm never going to get on the course. Anyway, I had a phone call, had my interview, and I was successful. And I spent a year, once a week, going up to the Reform Club in London for once a month for a series of lectures with people like Lucy Worsley and um, Earl Spencer and John Goodall, who's the architectural editor of Country Life, really hearing about these amazing country houses. I thought I'd write about something like cushions or wallpaper. I like wallpaper. Um, or actually, my original idea for a thesis was going to be on chimney pieces um, and the iconography and language of the chimney piece. But as I said, I've loved country houses ever since a child, loved big stately homes, Palladian mansions, but never as a gay man have I seen myself represented in them, or very rarely. Some work was done recently by the National Trust a couple of years ago, and Claire Balding did some amazing podcasts, which are worth checking out. But it's kind of gone a bit quiet. So I decided, as I looked more into the history of these great estates, I realized that there are lots of LGBTQ plus people who lived in these large estates, who's, who's, and there were kings and queens and members of the gentry and upper classes, 
whose story hasn't been told. And I want to tell their story. And my thesis for my now PhD, because I loved it so much, I didn't want the MA to end, so I converted to another five years of study for my PhD. Woohoo, lucky me. Um, I have a, a thesis title, which is The Country House as a Place of Refuge and Community for LGBTQ plus people. Now, I know that's a bit of a draft title, and it may well change over time. We'll see. But um, I have uh, submitted my first kind of essay plan to my supervisor, Adrian Tinniswood, he of The Long Weekend and Noble Ambitions fame. Uh, he liked the outline, and now I have started to put a structure in place uh, to actually do the research for my introduction. What I'm realizing as I do my PhD is it is not necessarily about the reading or, or even the research. It, it, the majority of it is the planning and the process. So I spent Friday sitting at my desk in my study, uh, writing out the process that I will follow over, I think about the next three months to start to pull together my introduction. So I thought I'd share that with you. So the introduction, it first starts off with historical context. So it's looking at, um, I'm gonna be finding academic references to the entomology of the word homosexual. It only really um, came into existence in 1869. So uh, how did it come about? What was the term used before then? When was it adopted? When did gay, when did LGBTQ come in? So really looking at kind of the descriptors um, of people from the LGBTQ plus community, the entomology of the descriptors, the, the adjective, is that right? The adjective or the noun uh, for people who have same sex relationships. Um, looking at then at some examples of people who would have lived through that change. So people like Cecil Beaton, um, who when uh, homosexuality was decriminalized, he wrote in his diaries how amazing it was to not go into a room and immediately think that you were a criminal. I can't, I just, I mean, I had some experience growing up in a Catholic school, what it was like to go into a room and feel very different. But can you imagine going into a room and feeling that you were a criminal? So I'm starting to look at kind of the context there. I'm going to be doing some work on Oscar Wilde's De Profundis. Uh, that's on order to understand how he described the situation around being a gay man, um, you know, obviously famously tried. Uh, and put in jail for two years, hard labor in Reading Jail. He wrote De Profundis as a letter uh, to Bozy, often very critical of Bozy. He definitely had some mental health problems when he was in Reading Jail. Um, and so I'm gonna be looking at that for context. There's a rumor that Queen Victoria refused to sign the Criminal Law Amendment Act of 1885 because she was so disgusted by the idea of homosexuality. That isn't true. But that in and of itself is homophobic. So I want to have a look at how that rumor came about uh, and where did that come from? I've been reading Amanda Foreman's amazing book about Georgina, the Duchess of Devonshire. And she talks about how often <coughs> young girls in Georgian society had very passionate and intimate relationships with each other before they got married. Almost like a bit of a trial before marriage, a, a bit of a re dress rehearsal. Um, and so I'm going to be uh, looking at research into that. What's interesting actually, is that, you know, when you look into the cracks of history, which you have to do for LGBTQ plus history, because realistically, there isn't much there except the criminal uh, side, because so much has been destroyed. You have to look at close relationships. You have to look at unusual setups and unusual living relationships. So Georgina lived in a throuple with Lady Elizabeth Foster, <coughs> Bess, and also the Duke. So what was going on there in terms of their relationship? Queen Anne and Sarah Churchill, whose husband uh, was the uh, John Montague, um, and uh, he, uh, sorry, he ended up uh, getting Blenheim Palace as John Churchill, uh, Blenheim Palace as a thank you uh, for defeating the French. But Anne and Sarah like this ever since children, their their closeness never subsided except when they had huge rows. Uh, and that they always got back together. 
So that's the first bit of my PhD. The second bit is looking at the idea in the introduction of community and exile. So looking at people like Cedric Morris and Arthur Lett Haynes, um, who were a couple uh, Victorians who actually lived around the corner from Oscar Wilde in Chelsea, but weren't so high profile, managed to live happily a quiet existence. Uh, and they set up the East Anglian School of Painting. So I want to look at that as one of the kind of, as a queer community. Um, I've already mentioned Horace Walpole, absolutely amazing. So going to be talking about how he was outed, how he ran back to Strawberry Hill because he was under threat. He could be imprisoned, you know, actually could put to death at some point throughout our history for being gay, for same-sex relations. He rather dramatically said, I'm going to take the veil. But whilst he was there in retreat for his life and his reputation, he descended into alcohol abuse and drug abuse, but he had a vision of a gauntleted hand above the staircase, and it gave him the idea for the first Gothic novel, The Castle of Otranto. So I'm going to be talking about him. I'm also going to be, uh, oh, someone's just texting me, sorry. I'm also going to be talking a little bit around uh, chapter 13 here, The Long Weekend, about um, Adrian describes Cecil Beaton's weekends at Ashcombe, his beautiful house, Olive Bailey, who had weekends for the LGBTQ plus community at uh, Leeds Castle. Interestingly, Ashcombe House still has, <clears throat> I'd say a bit of a gay connection. Madonna bought it. Um, and it was actually um, her marital home with Guy Ritchie. He lives there now, he got it in the divorce. But I think it's fascinating that, uh, you know, a gay icon ended up living in another gay icon's house. And then finally, um, in that section, I'm going to be looking at my ladies of Glengollen. I'll probably get this wrong. I have to get the pronunciation right. But this was Eleanor and Sarah, who were two Irish sort of gentry aristocrats, uh, two ladies who fell in love and would not be separated, even though their families tried to keep them apart. They tried to escape twice. <clears throat> they were captured and taken back to Kilkenny Castle, uh, where one of them lived. Uh, but eventually their families capitulated, but only if they left the country, only if they were exiled. Um, and so they came to live in Wales, which I love. Uh, maybe all good gays moved to Wales. Uh, they moved to North Wales um, and created a, a new home, uh, a new place together. They called Plas Newid, which literally means new place. I love that. Um, and then the, the last uh, part of my introduction is on threat and punishment, looking at Lord Montague and Peter Wildblood, looking at Peter's book, which is called Against the Law. I remember it's on here. What happened there? Why, how they were trialed? Looking at some of the contemporary salacious reporting at the time. I'm going to go into the British Library for that. Looking at Jeremy Thorpe, who was a liberal um, leader of the Liberal Party, um, who I remember in the 80s, um, you know, huge court case about whether or not he uh, tried to have his same sex partner, uh, ex lover, killed. I'm also going to be looking at some of the history of criminology in the 17th and 18th century. There's a fantastic book which I recommend um, 4,000 Years of Judging Desire, Sex and Punishment, right through from kind of Hebrew law, or actually right through pre Hebrew law, um, through to the modern day. So that's that's what I'm doing on the PhD. I hope you're enjoying the videos here on the Gay Aristo. We've got some amazing videos to come. We're going to be shooting at Beaver Castle at the end of this week. We've got some amazing videos coming um, on Victorian drag queens, on another video coming uh, with an interview with Neil McKenna, who's going to be talking about his book on Oscar Wilde, and also a video which we're filming with the World Monument Fund, which is at St. George's Church in Bloomsbury. So thank you so much for joining me on this live. First one I've done. I know a few people joined me today. Thank you so much. I love it when people leave comments. So if you want to make a comment below, I promise I read and respond to every single comment and they mean so much to me. So I'm not sort of shouting or preaching into the void. But for now, wherever you are and whoever you love, I wish you a wonderful evening. Take care.